first we want to get to, though, we want to discuss what are the top odds for various NFL draft props a month out from the 2023 NFL draft. We are giving you our informed decisions on what we think are going to hit for these specific categories. These are not best bets, but instead what we know and think will happen at these various spots. If it's who's the first overall pick, who's the first defensive player drafted, all of that and more coming up. Guys, let's start off with the first one here. And that being the obvious one, the one that I think is very telling of how the odds are shaping out. Who's going to be the first overall pick to the Carolina Panthers? Now they moved up. They're going to be drafting a quarterback. I don't think there's really any other room for error to happen here that they don't take a quarterback in this spot. The way that the odds are shaped out, CJ Stroud is leading at minus 300, Bryce Young at plus 250, Anthony Richardson at plus 900, and Will Levis at plus 5,000. So, Ryan, I want to kick it over to you first. Yes. What do we think here? What do you think is going to happen? Who is going to be the first overall pick based on that information? Joe, I want to tell you a little story. I'm going to take you back to the 2021 (laughs) NFL draft where this time in the draft process, the favorite to go number three overall was Mac Jones at minus 300. Two days beforehand, it flipped, and young Trey Lance was the man who is now the betting favorite. Do not get too much of these betting odds at this time of year is on is the source that I am saying here. I do not think that this is a foregone conclusion that it is CJ Stroud. I actually still think it's going to be Bryce Young. I do. There is could it be and look, this isn't a definite a definitive answer that I'm giving you here, right? Like could it be CJ Stroud would I be shocked? No. But I still think that there is not nearly the consensus in the pro organization that there seems to be on Twitter and there seems to be in the media side of the business, right? And Carolina has nothing to hide. You have number one overall pick. So the fact that there is silence tells me that there might be a little bit of, we need to keep digging here and make sure that we're making the right decision process in this time of the year. So I actually think it's going to be Bryce Young. So if you're a betting favorite, if you're whatever, I think Bryce Young might be this might be the pick here. Might be the pick. Matt, what do you think? I'm still going with C.J. Stroud, just for the history, right, of Frank Wright and the kind of quarterbacks that he seems to be interested in. I think C.J. fits that mold a little bit more. Now, Tepper, the owner, we'll see. Maybe he kind of gets a little bit more involved and puts his two cents in there for Bryce. But uh, I just feel like with uh, with uh, Frank's just history that C.J. still, I think, has a slight lead in this. But it's hard to really deny either one of them. I mean, do any of us really think that it's going to be – Anyone outside of these two gentlemen? I mean, I think it really is. These are the final two candidates, and it's going to be a game-time decision. And for the Carolina Panthers, I don't think you can make a bad decision. Mm -hmm. I think Bryce is a phenomenal football player. I think CJ is a phenomenal football player. And they got uh, a lot of good football ahead of them as far as playmakers and as far as leaders as organizations. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of lean in agreement with Matt here. I think that, Ryan, you you – might have a little more information than we do. But if I'm just going off of the tea leaves without having <laughs> any sourcing, um, it we have the video after the pro day of you, – you mean, you, you, you mean like the one the that Kyle Shanahan did with Justin Fields a couple years ago too? Like that right. one? Like, yes. That, that, right, right. That's, right. that's yes. true. Well, wait, did he say when you moved to sh- – Dude, he was he was Joe. He was giddy, brother. He was giddy. It it happens every That's year. That's just locker room talk, yeah. right? That's locker room talk. All right, man. All right, like, there's all, there's also a thing we called also, deflections and smoke screens this time of year as well. But you know, we yes. also have the the underdog fantasy video that Josh McCown is evaluating CJ Stroud, and he is just completely drooling over him again. Just minor tea leaves. Yeah. I, I think I would be more willing to commit to Stroud in this spot. But again, to Matt's point, if it's not CJ Stroud, it's Bryce Young. Yeah. And I, I, if I'm betting on this, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm just waiting to see how the odds end up actually stacking up before I make this decision. This one, I think, is a little too early. And you mentioned that earlier with the Trey Lance thing, that the odds right now are not going to be what they're going to be a few days before because the books are probably going to be a lot more informed on what might actually happen. Sure. But right. that's also at the same time is why right now is the best time to, to play some of these bets before the odds aggressively shift. Exactly. So either CJ Stroud or Bryce Young, I'm leaning CJ Stroud. 
any pushback on that fight. I can't wait for Vontae Mack to be the number one overall pick, and we're all just kind of reeling <laughs> here. Shut up. What happened, man? Shut what up. happened? <laughs> no, I mean, but it, it's it, this is just a fun time of year, though, because things come out in such odd times, right? Then you're going to – I mean, next week there might be something breaks so that you're like, oh, maybe it's not C.J. Stroud. And then a couple days beforehand it might be like, oh, it's not C.J. Stroud at all, or it is C.J. Stroud. And some people were right all along, or some people were wrong all along, right? Like that's kind of the, how this process works. So it's going to be interesting, man. But I think I would be – look, I would be very – I'm about 100% positive that it's not going to be anybody else but C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young. Like, those are the guys. I don't think that Carolina can take the gamble of an Anthony Richardson or a Will Levis at that point. Like, you need a little bit more of the higher floor, in my opinion, in that selection. So, I think that's who it's going to be, man. But we've seen chaos, Joe. I mean, they're even talking about Carolina being open to trading back after trading up. Like, I don't know what's happening, man. I mean, what if if Carolina trades, right, and does some sort of deal with the Rams? Ravens gets Lamar Jackson, right? Or so, I mean, who knows? I, I saw man, the but. latest though was that that Reich said that they do not now intend to trade the pick. That was what I saw until yesterday. they trade the pick. Yeah, yeah. Just saying, man. You can only draft Joe. I here. tell you, man. You can only believe about seventeen percent of stuff that you hear this time of year, man. Seventeen percent. That's it. I've done a study on this. Do, does <laughs> so, so? Does that mean I can only believe seventeen percent of that seventeen percent? Like, technically speaking, that information I shouldn't. Believe uh, it. You just hurt my head, man. Uh, you just hurt my head. <laughs> what, do you, what do you like? You're, that sounded like Paul Rudd from Anchorman right there. Uh, 60% of the time, it works yes. every time. It's like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, exactly. It, it's really, The great thing about this time of year is the drama, like Ryan is mentioning. It just continues to build with anticipation. That's why a draft show in the NFL is one of the most watched shows of the football ball season oddly enough and no one's even playing it's just dudes talking at a desk while people walk up and just hug the commissioner which is amazing but it's really exciting and and i really again going back to frank it's just you know it's like dating bro he seems to date the same kind of looking qbs and that's why i keep leaning towards stroud fitting more of that that model s that he's looking for yeah well and joe do you remember last year who was the quarterback that was a hundred percent going to pittsburgh this time of year you remember that it was malik, malik Willis, Will- I will yes. and then That's he drops to the third round and kenny pickett is the 20th overall selection we, it, it happens yeah. every single year with this kind of stuff man every single year definitely well this second overall pick i think is the more volatile pick yep. uh, it, it, there is not a lot of agreement on who goes in this spot especially for the fact that you have will anderson even brought into the discussion as do they even go quarterback do they decide to go edge and maybe wait until next year i will say i think that, that that's more of a possibility than we're willing to some people are willing to admit the way that the odds currently look for the houston texans at number two assuming again they stay in the spot Bryce Young, minus 300 odds. C.J. Stroud, plus 300. Anthony Richardson, plus 1,400. Will Levis, plus 1,600. And then Will Anderson, plus 3,000. Matt, I want to kick it to you first. What do you think? Who do you think is going to be this pick for the Houston Texans? Assuming maybe off of what you said with the Carolina Panthers, maybe C.J. Stroud's not on the board. Who do you think to go with? I think the second best player really in the draft and someone you can't really pass up in this situation is Bryce Young. But at the same time, I feel like the Texans really do need just a lot of dudes on their football team at multiple positions. So I feel like they might see something as this continues to go in this process of, all right, maybe some of these QBs are going to go a little bit later in the draft than maybe earlier projected by so many uh, of these of these mock draft situations. Um, and especially, too, with the fact that they have a pick at 12. You know, I think that there's still going to be a possibility where they get what they want here with the second pick and then an opportunity to get the quarterback that they really want at the number 12 pick. And I think that will be an interesting, you know, situation. So that's where, you know, is it even possible to be with Will Anderson or even a Jalen Carter at that number two pick for them? I don't know. I just think, again, D'Amico Ryan's, you know, defensive minded head coach wants to be physical, wants to dominate the line of scrimmage, has done it really well with the 49ers. And you saw how they do it, right? They're physical, they're tough as hell in the box, right? And they run and play fast. So that's where I kind of uh, debate whether or not this might be a defensive pick of Will Anderson 
um, and then passing up and getting a quarterback that they want at that 12 pick later on. It would be fascinating if that's the way they went, Matt, because then that number third overall pick with the Cardinals becomes such a bargaining chip, man. Like Carolina, mm, I mean, it's like right. biggest bidder, brother. Like Pan- uh, yeah. Colts, you want to trade up one spot. Do the Falcons want to get into the dance? Do the, do the Raiders want to get into the dance? Like that becomes such an right. interesting situation. I ultimately do think it's going to be a quarterback just because I, I think new regime. I don't know if they believe in Davis Mills as far as like the development aspect of it, but I, yeah. I wouldn't throw it all the way off the table. I wouldn't throw it off the way off the table. Joe, I'm a little confused by these odds though, man, because I don't see Hendon Hooker on here. And <laughs> oh, Mike Tannenbaum <laughs> told me up. that he's going top five. So I'm just trying to figure it out, man. But I mean, honest. All right. Now, hey, Hendon's a baller. I like though. Hendon a lot. Okay. I like Hendon right. a lot, man. Hendon's a, you know, okay. So I know Mike, you know, says some crazy crazy things every now and then, but he is a baller. But yeah, I don't think he's going and top he five. And he gave me some beans, man. All right. So <laughs> with the beans. Where are the beans, man. player? Uh, all right, th- here's my here's my yeah out out yeah go ahead. I was just gonna say my perspective on this, and I obviously I picked Bryce Young to be the guy that goes number one overall. This is just some insights in infused with speculation here, where I am not sure that CJ Stroud would be the foregone conclusion at number two. I'm just not sure about it. So in this situation. I actually think it might be Anthony Richardson or Will Levis. I mean, for this for this conversation, right, Joe, you want me to pick one guy. So I guess I'll go with Anthony Richardson as the second guy off the board. Just there's just something telling me, man, just based upon some things I'm hearing and you know, some of the tea leaf stuff, is that I'm not sure that they'll value CJ as much. I think CJ could potentially fall to the third overall pick, and then he becomes that bargaining chip at three. That's ultimately what I think could happen. So I think it's going to be one of the toolsy upside guys at Houston because I also think that Houston understands that they're a bad roster right now, right? Where it's like mm, I can right. I can develop Anthony Richardson along, and when he hits his window of being the best possible player that he can be, that's when my roster has been developed a little bit further. Maybe I've been able to, you know, acquire a, a good amount of talent to be able to put around him. So I'll take Anthony Richardson here, man. Mostly just because I'm just not sure if CJ Stroud's the guy at two for them if he's on the board. Good odds, too. Yes. Good odds but my to one it. my one counter to that would be the fact that it's hard to develop a, a young raw quarterback with not much experience around a bad football team. So that would be my one debate. If we were in the room, right, with the whole staff and scouting department, I'd be like, listen, we're a bad football team, and we're going to put this quarterback in this situation and rely that heavily on him and let him take the bumps and bruises. You know, with with him, I don't know. It's just – it's tough. I feel like that would be that would be a big stretch for their their organization, you know. And they would have to adapt their style – immediately yeah. <laughs> right adapt the style and take advantage of of his ability to run be powerful throw the ball vertically down the field and i just don't know if they're ready to do that and i feel like if they did that you know they would just be wasting his physicality in his first four years of his rookie contract and wouldn't be able to take advantage of it when they were in position to then be a contender so the way that i look at this situation here at, at number two a lot of similarities to what you said, Ryan, where I don't think that this is going to be a CJ Stroud, Bryce Young pick, regardless if if either are on the, on the board. Sure. I think it's going to be Will Levis or Anthony Richardson based on indications that I've had. I've also gotten from those indications, they're not very excited from the completion percentage issues, the accuracy issues of Anthony Richardson. I just think as, as weird as it seems, and I think we can all agree here that Will Levis is – probably the fourth amongst the group of quarterbacks that he might end up in this spot. Nick Casario has made some really weird drafting decisions, some very strange drafting decisions. And I think that first of all, he values the bigger, stronger quarterbacks. These two guys specifically who are built like uh, one's built like a tight end. One's built like a, a linebacker. I just think that that Levis could end up being the pick in this spot because there is some concern for what Anthony Richardson has put on tape and then he hasn't put a whole lot. And I know that Will Levis hasn't put a lot of great <laughs> stuff on tape either, but there is a vast difference in between that that completion percentage that for whatever reason 
they like Will Levis a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, Will's such a divisive prospect this year, man, because like I, I, I can understand the draw to him, right? I mean, it's not hard to understand mm-hmm. 6'3", 230-plus. Well, 6'4", actually, he weighed in at the combine. 6'4", 230 pounds, strong arm, athletic kid. And all the indications and all the things you hear behind the scenes is that he's a really great kid. And he's a good leader, and all those things right. matter, right? Like the intangibles matter just as much about what you can see on film sometimes for the quarterback position. So I, I get it, and I wouldn't be shocked if it happens. Because, I mean, there was one point this offseason, Joe, where I was kind of convinced that Will Levis was going to be the first quarterback off the board just because that was kind of the, the trap that NFL teams kind of fall into sometimes, right? So mm. it honestly right. wouldn't sh- shock me if that's the way. That's why I literally in my – in my argument, I said I think it could be Richardson or Will Levis. Like you could convince me of either guy in that situation because I think that I think that there are more prototype aspects to what Will Levis brings to the table comparative to the top two quarterbacks. You know, he's a little bigger, a little stronger, a little stronger arm. But at the end of the day, I think we know that the film speaks a little bit of a different story, but teams fall into this trap all the time. They really do. Guys, let's get to the next position group or position rather. Uh, pick rather, and it's the first position. First wide receiver drafted here are the top four. Jackson Smith and Jigba at minus 200. Quentin Johnston at plus 450. Zay Flowers at plus 600. And Jordan Addison at plus 700. First of all, I got to say, I, I don't think Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to be the first wide receiver taken. I know that he's had a very positive process, but I, I don't know, man. I feel like him being the first selected is more unlikely uh, than it is likely. Matt, your thoughts first here on, well, on who I, you think. Well, who are you go with, man? Yeah, I mean, you can't guy, give man. us all that. All right, then, all right. Yeah, like, let's go. Fine, fine. Yeah. I'm throwing out there that I think that Quinton Johnson is going to be the first wide receiver selected. Okay. I think that as much as we've had a history of the NFL being attracted to speed, I don't think we've got that de facto super explosive Jamison Williams, uh, Henry Ruggs type that has a crazy 40 time that then – Entices all the NFL teams to go after him. Jalen Hyatt, I see Quentin Johnson. Jalen Hyatt, Jay, but Jalen yeah. Hyatt didn't run in the low four threes like I think we were hoping for. He still had a great forty time. Can you run four three one? I thought it was like four three one, four three two. Am I wrong? I thought he was four four. I, I might be wrong. God, keep going. Maybe keep going. I'm, maybe I, I I'm misremembering. Keep going. Keep going. I, I just think that with all these smaller <laughs> slot deep threat types, all these smaller compact guys, I, I think a lot of teams are just going to say like, "Well, the only one at the top." that doesn't fit that and is more of an X is Quentin Johnston. And I think a team might pull the trigger on him just off of that approach. I don't have any information or sourcing off this one. This is just purely off of how the class is filled yeah, out. We're, and we're just what having might fun. Have, we're having fun. We're just having yeah. fun. But this is how I think that what might make a lot of sense. Matt, what do you think though? I'm going speed player. I'm going Zay Flowers. I'm going with Zay Flowers. You know, I, I really love his ability to run and catch. I think, uh, you know, he really is the reincarnation of an Antonio Brown type of football player. Um, he's a game changer. He can play outside. He can play inside. His stop and go ability, I think, is super elite. And I, I think right now, you know, it just and this is me like being my own GM. You know, I, I love players that are like like a Jalen Waddle, like a Tyreek Hill. And, and when I see Zay Flowers, I see that type of versatility where you can throw him screens behind the line of scrimmage and let him go up there and get eight, ten yards, right, on a well-blocked screen. You could do speed sweeps with him. You could do reverses with him. You could put all your little gadget plays and just get him in space. You know, the 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 possibilities I think with him as an offensive coordinator in an offense really is just is borderline endless. And that's where I get excited with a guy like that that can do a little bit of everything, you know, stretch the defense, get over the top, do a great job of running really good routes between the hashes, shaking people, winning one-on-ones, and at the end of the day, just taking the football and outrunning people for a touchdown. And I think that is uh, why I value him so high. Yeah, I mean, Matt, you don't have to convince me of Zay Flowers. Joseph knows, even dating back to the summer, I'm about as high on Zay Flowers as pretty much anybody out there. In this conversation, though, I actually do think it's going to be Jackson Smith and Jigba. I do. And and the reasons I believe that is because I think that there's some question marks with a lot of players at the top as far as what the floor is, right? The ceiling is tremendous on guys like Zay Flowers, Joshua Downs, Jalen Hyatt. But the floor, I think, is the question that some of those guys have. And then Quentin Johnson, for me, Joe, like that's the biggest boomer bust guy in this draft. You know, like he is six foot two and six eight, six foot three, athletic, explosive. 
but he doesn't play like a big receiver, right? Like he struggles at the catch point. Yeah. He has like a weird profile. He does the small wide receiver things pretty well, but he doesn't really do the big wide receiver things well, which is just kind of an odd profile. I think what Jackson Smith and Jacob brings, though, is that like you know what he is, man. Like he's a known commodity, and he's going to be a good football player at the next level. I think some people could question, yeah, is the ceiling incredibly high? And I would say no. I mean, I, I compared him to Keenan Allen throughout most of this process, where I'm just like, he might never be that top five receiver in the NFL, right? Like he might never be that type of guy, but he might surprise you, be like, oh wow, he had 90, 100 catches almost every year that he played. Like he's just that type of guy. He might never average 15 yards a catch, but he'll average. 10, 11, 12, and just kind of be that consistent chain mover type, right? More that possession slot type. Yeah. So I think that in a class that is just littered with high upside, low floor type of football players, I think some teams will kind of urge towards the floor and be like, but hey, it's not a great wide receiver class. Give me the guy that I know could be a known contributor to me, a guy that I'm for sure at worst is going to be a really nice secondary pass catcher, if not a high volume type of number one receiver. So give me Jackson Smith and Jigba. It's boring because he's got the low, he's got the best odds, obviously, to be the guy. But I just feel like that's yeah. kind of where teams might steer this year. The cool thing is, too, is I think at 21, that really could be the pick. It yep. could be him and it could be Zay Flowers at the end of the day because I think they they do need the Chargers to revamp their receiver position. Yep. You know, they're, they're mm. getting a little bit, you know, older with their veteran receivers. They're great football players, but it starts to – you need to start to get a little bit more speed and athleticism around Justin Herbert and his young career. No doubt. Yeah, that could be a good good pick for the – Los Angeles Chargers. They also maybe could invest in a tight end. And the twenty the twenty twenty three NFL draft features a lot of really good tight ends. I remember early on in this process there was this debate of who's going to be the first tight end selected. The media created this debate of is it Dalton Kincaid from Utah or is it Michael Mayer from Notre Dame. And one of the things that I thought was really funny during the NFL Combine was that um, I think it was Charles Robinson put out this graphic through Yahoo Sports. And on this graphic was uh, the top players that he pulled a bunch of different scouts and they all gave votes for top players that they think are the best at each position. It was something along those lines. And unanimously, Michael Mayer won. I quote tweeted it and I'm like, really, really shocked that Dalton Kincaid's not on here. It's a little telling. Now the Dalton Kincaid lovers in the media came in to defend him and also in the comments <laughs> of the original post as well. For Again, for some reason, Dalton Kincaid has become this trending name at the tight end position but i believe with the current odds the way that they're shaped out michael mayer minus 115 dalton kincaid plus 170 and darnell washington plus 350 that michael mayer will be the first tight end selected especially for the fact that dalton kincaid hasn't done any testing so why are we suddenly going to bump this guy up late in the process when we've got no numbers we don't really even know what his health situation is like because he's been injured throughout this process so Let's stick with the guy who's been number one since the beginning of the year, Michael Mayer. Ryan, your thoughts being the Notre Dame specialist. I mean, I, 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 I have thought <laughs> it's going to be Michael Mayer since the season, after the season, up until now. I, like, I've been because you're right, Joe. There has been a lot of narratives out there. I mean, we you mentioned Don Kincaid, but there's also been the Darnell Washington tight end one people. There's also been yeah. the Luke Musgrave out of Oregon State tight end one hive, which has kind of been a very oddity in the in this class. I think it's Michael Mayer, man, because I just think that. Again, we kind of underrate the guys that just do everything well sometimes and don't give them enough credit for right. that, right? It's like, is he as fast as Luke Musgrave? No, he's not. Is he as big as Dornell Washington? No. But his film is better than all of them, in my opinion, right? So you look at that and say the combination of production, floor, physicality, and competitiveness. Like, that's Michael Mayer to me, right? And, I mean, Dalton Kincaid is – 6'4", 240. He's never going to play in line much. He's com a complete flex tight end who is coming off an injury, who's not been able to test it all this offseason. Darnell Washington is Older. a big, toolsy blocker type that doesn't have the production to back up, right? Doesn't quite have the film that obviously Michael Mayer has. And then Luke Musgrave's a guy that, that only played in two football games this year. So I think when I look at it, yeah. I think that this one has been a farce this whole time. I think it's Michael Mayer, and I think it always has been. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you guys. I think Michael Mayer is really kind of the the shoe in here for this one because, like you said, Ryan, he just he does everything extremely well. And I think that we're we're you know at least the media undervalues the ability to run block and to do those things that really don't get as much praise, you know, on television on those highlight reels. 
you know, I think his ability to be a great physical asset for a football team on the edge and being aggressive as a running team is something that will be the difference maker in him going first over some of the others. And even with the draft, too, I mean, just when you look at the first round, I mean, all these teams that I think are, are potentials, like I think Atlanta Falcons, they would love a guy like Michael Mayer. Right. I think the Chicago Bears would love a player like Michael Mayer. You know, I mean, even, you know, the Houston Texans, the New York Jets, the New England Patriots. I mean, the Green Bay Packers, the Washington Commanders, like all those teams, I think, you know, would love to have a guy like that. That is a reliable run runner, uh, route runner, excuse me, pass catcher, really good in the play action game, but also just adds another level of physicality on the outside to their run game. Moving into the trenches. To the offensive line position. Here we go. There baby. seems to be a two way race between the top two guys, that being Paris Johnson from Ohio State and Peter Skaronsky from Northwestern, for who's going to be the first offensive tackle selected in this year's draft. Those odds are minus 150 for Johnson, plus 200 for Skaronsky, and then Broderick Jones, plus 550. So the way that I'm looking at this one, guys is that last year, Evan Neal was considered to be the best tackle in the class. He was considered far and away to the, be the best offensive tackle in the class. And a lot of the things that we got with Evan Neal is that he was a ridiculous athlete, a fantastic physical specimen for how big he was and how easy he was able to move. But he doesn't, despite being mocked as the number one tackle, was not the first tackle selected last season. I believe it was Ika McQuanu, correct, correct, Ryan? I, I didn't want to say that with certainty. It was Ika McQuanu, who many would have argued in that circumstance was maybe the little more technically refined player compared to Evan Neal and less of the athlete. So I think with that information in mind, as much as we want to sit here with these offensive linemen to discuss the better athletes can be selected, I think, I feel like Peter Skaronsky might be the first one drafted amongst the offensive linemen just from the simple fact that he is the furthest along, the most ready to play. And I believe some of these bad teams that are picking in the top 10, whether maybe it's the Raiders, maybe it is the Atlanta Falcons, if they want to add in, in an offensive lineman with, amongst that grouping, that they're going to want to make that investment for a guy who that they know is going to protect their guys now instead of letting them come along with a bad roster. So Peter Skronsky for me. Ryan, your thoughts? I think it's going to be Paris Johnson Jr. Uh, and it's not anything to do with the actual quality of football player, right? Because I think that Peter Skronsky right this second – is a better player than Paris Johnson. But I think that the the thing that you're going to see in this class, and I know you tried to compare it to last year, Joe, but I think it's a little bit different because last year you're talking about an offensive tackle versus an offensive tackle. There's going to be some teams that value Skaronsky more inside a guard, and that completely changes yeah. the formula at that point. If yeah. the team thinks that he's a guard, and then there's this other high upside tackle – most teams are going to side with the tackle at nine times out of ten times, right? So I think that there's yeah. just some uncertainty. I think Peter Skronsky is a tackle at the next level. I think he can play tackle. But there are, is a reality where maybe he's a all-pro guard and not just a really good starting offensive tackle at the next level, right? So in that case, if a team views it that way, I think that they'll offer Paris Johnson, right? And I think that most teams – are archaic with the way that they think in terms of that, right? They're traditionalists in the sense that offensive tackle is a more important position than offensive guard. It is. So when you look at that and if you think that that Paris Johnson is a pure offensive tackle, which you should at 6'6", 36 plus inch arms, really athletic kid, and you are less convinced with the 6'4", 32 and a quarter inch arm Peter Skaronsky, which is understandable, I think that a team will potentially yeah. opt with Paris Johnson personally. Yeah, it's an interesting development, too, because with Skaronsky, uh, I find it as uh, this is, it, again, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It, it depends on really just how you view this. Because in Skaronsky, I could say in, in our you know general manager hats, right, that I love this guy because he could be a center, he could be a guard for us, and if injury happens, worst case scenario, we could also play him at tackle. And I think that's important, too. He is the ultimate swing man as far as, we can fit him in where we need and where he's most desired at our current moment with our team. You know, that's why I even think like a team like the Philadelphia Eagles could be like really interested in a guy like Skaronsky and being the next Kelsey, you know, or a guy that plays alongside Kelsey, you know, in his development and learning from an all pro guy. So I think I give Skaronsky a slight edge just because of his versatility and his experience 
to be just the ultimate fifth or sixth guy in an offensive line immediately from day one. Yeah, that, that's Guys, last one. That's an interesting last one. We're, we're we're coming up on time, Ryan. I want to just get this last one in here. We get we're <laughs> getting it, Ryan, we gotta, we I wanted to hear what you have to say. <laughs> but yeah. we got it. We we're not cutting off Jordan McFadden. We got to get to that interview to get it uh, <laughs> fitted in on time. But really, really, really quickly, one minute each on on this pick here. We'll First talk, defensive <laughs> player selected first defensive player selected the way that the odds are currently shaping out will anderson minus 500 jalen carter plus 800 tyree wilson plus 800 my quick thoughts on this Kayvon thibodeau was the most talented edge rusher last year in my eyes was not the guy that was selected at the position will anderson this year is the most talented edge, edge rusher in the class i think that this process is going to be over thought and ryan put me onto this a couple weeks ago i think this might be tyree wilson from texas tech i think a lot of teams are going to get Go bonkers, cuckoo for co Cocoa Puffs for this big, <laughs> strong guy in Tyree Wilson out of Texas Tech. So give me Tyree Wilson as this first defense player. So I'll 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 raise I'll raise your your bet here, Joe, and I'll give you one better. I th would be surprised if it's not Tyree Wilson at this point, just based on everything Ooh. I hear. Man, there's a lot of teams connected with wow. him. I think some people are overthinking Will Anderson. Will Anderson would be my pick, but I think it's Tyree Wilson as well. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know what? Like, just for the sake of odds and to be a safe bet right now and just bet with the house, I'm going with Will Anderson just because his production value and his ability to kind of do a little bit of everything. He's well coached. He's been on Nick, Nick Saban, extremely productive. So uh, I'm going with a sure-handed bet at a player that really knows the game extremely well.